When you play marbles, you know, the boulder always gets a little dirt on it. And by rolling the boulder on your, flipping it with your thumb, sooner or later, you know, you're wearing out a little spot in your hand, you would wear actually a hole right in your fingernail. When you cheat, when you play marbles, all right, you pick up your boulder like this, all right? Then you roll your hand over closer to the circle. Wire was, was the basis of Gilbert and Bennett. They found that they could do things with wire that nobody else had found uh, ways to do before. I was born on Main Street. I have, I move, I've moved one mile of my life. I've, been, I've traveled all over, but I haven't moved, but I've lived here all my life. Here we have three Georgetown families, Irish, Scandinavian, and Italian. Art Moore, Bertel Rosendahl, and Serena Nazaro. This is a Georgetown story. There's one spot down by the river, and uh, we used to go down there and just sit there and talk. We thought that was great. A small thing can be important to you. The sons and daughters of the first European immigrants moved inland from Long Island Sound and took advantage of the power of the Norwalk River. There was a sense of possibility at the river. This is where America was going to happen. Europeans brought with them the technologies they developed over centuries in the old world. In particular, they knew how to harness water power and animal power uh, for their purposes. Animal power was extremely limited, water power extensive in the streams of New England. People were looking for good spots along the river so that they could build dams and control the currents for their water wheels. Before long, dams and mill ponds stretched up and down the Norwalk River. You can still see the old foundations along Old Mill Road. Mill owners were really leading figures in the communities and very much respected by their neighbors. This area was carved out of the original long lots of Fairfield. As this area develops, it's known as all kinds of names. The Long Hollow, Honey Hill, Hogs Ridge, Copps Farm, Osborne Town, Good Sail Hill, Little Boston, Darling's Corner, St. John's Corner, Whiskey Lane. Georgetown, it was nothing because it was in such a location. Parts of Reading came to it, parts of Weston, parts of Wilton, and, and even a little bit of, of Ridgefield. Here's the Boundary Rock. This is where the original towns of Norwalk, Fairfield, and Reading came together. George Abbott is one of the many millers who operated near this site. One tradition is that Georgetown was named after George Abbott. Over time, factories in Georgetown are beginning to produce for a wider market. But transportation is the limiting factor. Old Mill Road was first an Indian trail. Then it was known as the Great Road from Norwalk to Danbury. Anything you could haul, drag, or carry moved up and down this road. By the 19th century, it was a toll road. 25 cents for a wagon, 12 cents for a chair, and a penny for each sheep or pig. Oh, and by the way, there was no charge if you were going to church or a funeral. Benjamin Gilbert, a frustrated tanner, found himself surrounded by animal hair. With the help of his wife, who was a weaver, in 1818, they started a little home business, weaving the long hairs into sieves like this one. Benjamin Gilbert takes his son-in-law, Sturgis Bennett, into the family business. This is where the real family connections begin. By the late 1830s, the Gilbert and Bennett Company had about 30 employees. Half of them were related. Both Gilbert and Bennett were founding members of a new faction of Methodism led by Reverend William Stilwell in Georgetown. These so-called Stilwellites held themselves up to a much higher moral standard and set the tone for the company and the community around it. 
You go back to the old uh, story about Benjamin Gilbert making a sieve out of horsehair. And all of a sudden, the light goes on. Maybe if I had fine wire, I can do the same thing, and it would be a lot better. And they did that. They found that they could do things with wire that nobody else had found ways to do before. By the 1850s, Gilbert and Bennett was turning out products that changed the way Americans lived. Chicken wire gave farmers control over their livestock. This is the first time we've got standardized fencing. You know the phrase, good fences make good neighbors. Gilbert and Bennett made chicken wire for the entire country. In 1852, the railroad linked Georgetown to the global economy. Shipping goods to market was the chief challenge for Georgetown's early manufacturers. When the railroads came, the speed change was enormous. It would have seemed like science fiction to those who traveled on it. Now they could get raw materials in, finished wire out, all by rail. Just five miles away in Poverty Hollow, the little factories eventually failed because the railroad didn't come their way. The railroad needed an army of cheap labor to lay track. They didn't have to be skilled, just strong and hungry. Economic and social dislocation in Europe sent the first great waves of European immigrants to the United States, beginning in the 1840s. The potato famine devastated Irish agriculture for three years running. Over a decade, more than a million and a quarter Irish died. Europeans were pushed rather than pulled to the New World. The company, Gilbert and Bennett, used to recruit immigrants when they came off the boat in New York and offer them a job and a place to live. And that's how a lot of them came here. The first immigrants to Georgetown recruited those who followed them. With letters home, with prepaid tickets, they elaborated chains that connected them from the new world to the old. Historians have called this phenomenon chain migration. At work, six days a week, the immigrants were learning American ways learning the ways of the mill. But Sunday was devoted to family, church, and the ways of the old country. Immigrants brought their religious faiths with them. There were often large numbers of churches and rather small congregations. My father happened to be the, one of the founding members of the Lutheran Church in Georgetown. And on top of that, he was also a deacon. So they had the ethnic bond, they had the religious bond, they had the family bond, all working uh, within their individual churches. Five churches in one square mile tells you the difference in the people that were in Georgetown. Meanwhile, the issue of slavery had been festering under the American skin since the very beginning. Many in Connecticut were for abolition, but New England manufacturers still depended on the Southern slave economy. On November 28, 1838, there was an abolitionist meeting at the Georgetown Baptist Church. Early the following morning, a keg of gunpowder placed directly beneath the pulpit exploded, blowing the church off its foundation. Despite the violence, the Georgetown Anti-Slavery Society, one of the earliest in Connecticut, was established a week later. The Gilbert and Bennett Company entered a new era when Edwin Gilbert hired David H. Miller. This was the beginning of four generations of Millers heading the factory. They carried on the Gilbert and Bennett legacy of serving the community. They might as well have called the place Gilbert, Bennett, and Miller. David Miller was company president when the Civil War broke out. He led about 36 young men from Georgetown to fight for the Union. The 23rd Regiment was known as the Wide Awakes. With Southern markets closed to Gilbert and Bennett products, inventory at the mill backed up. 
Responding to the challenge with inventiveness, the company coated its wire mesh with paint and in 1861 introduced a product that improved the quality of life, wire window screen. Until then, cheesecloth was the only way to keep insects outside and off your food. The introduction of window screens after the Civil War made a tremendous contribution to American health. When you bought screening and made screens to put in your windows, you could have all your windows wide open. It was a very big deal. The invention has been called the most humane contribution the 19th century made to the preservation of sanity and good temper. Factory fires were always a threat, and the mill had several of them. On the morning of May 11th, 1874, the main warehouse caught fire. There was $2 million worth of damage and only $40,000 worth of insurance. They were devastated. The mill and the community were a family. There was an obligation. 19 days after the fire, the company reorganized and incorporated as Gilbert and Bennett Manufacturing and began to rebuild. Because of the disaster, the company and Georgetown together grew stronger. Georgetown was a one industry company town. People came to Georgetown to work for Gilbert and Bennett. Gilbert and Bennett rented them their homes, built the post office, donated the school to the community. They ran the show. For each employee, there was a three by five card made out. The superintendent would comment about each one of these. He's a good worker. He's a good worker when he's sober, or don't hire again, he's a drunk, and so on. I went to work at Gilbert and Bennett as an office boy, and you did just about anything and everything that anybody else in the office wanted you to do. Like, when you're going to over to the post office to get the mail at 1030, um, run down to the shoemaker and get my shoes. Other things that I have to do when I went to the post office was to buy stamps, and I bought sheets of stamps. And I had to tear them row by row so that anyone that needed stamps didn't come up and get a whole sheet. Anyway, I was advanced to become the timekeeper as so I was assigned to go up and pick up the payroll from the train. They gave me a pistol. And uh, never having ever had a pistol in my hand before, and I looked at it and I couldn't even turn the barrel. It was, I don't know how old that pistol was, but uh, I could have done better with if I'd hit somebody over the head with it, and I couldn't shoot them. One of the other duties as a timekeeper was that I helped put up the payroll, and everyone was paid in cash. And I had to dole out the change for whatever the amount was for that person. Then we had to count whatever money we had left over, and it had to balance with what we had gotten, what we had paid, and what we should have left over. And one point, uh, we were short a penny. We had to check everything. Everything on the table, everything where we were sitting. We had to get up from the chairs, get down on our hands and knees and look around underneath the desk there, on the, on the rug, moving everything to try and find where that penny could have gone. And it turned out I had dropped one and it landed in the cuff of my trousers. Portland Avenue, capital of Georgetown. That's where we all grew up. Incubator Avenue, they call it, because there were so many kids there. <laughs> Don't forget, every building was two families in there. Portland Avenue was also nicknamed the League of Nations. There were Swedes, there were Danes, there were Norwegians, Italians, and Irish, and English. And the reason they were there, because they worked in the factory, and the reason they were in those houses, because they were renting homes from the factory. There was something going on all the time. And you could always go out and get in the game, tag, baseball, numberly peg, kick the can. Playing on the street, playing in between houses. We went fishing. Kids were always busy doing something. Kids were welcomed in every house. Everybody was trusted. Not, nothing was ever, never worried about anything happening. If we locked up our house, the key to the back door was underneath the doormat. Every 
lock on Portland Avenue had the same lock. It was a skeleton key. And you could open any house if you wanted to get in. So you never locked doors. We walked everywhere. We walked to school. We walked to the church. We walked everywhere. We didn't go all over town in cars because we didn't have cars. There was only one phone on the street, Mrs. Kenny, because she used to write the news for the Bridgeport Post. Mrs. Lindstrom, down, who lived diagonally over here, would know that that's uh, Prince. That's Len Taylor's dog. That's the way it was. Everybody knew everything about everybody, whether they had cats or dogs or kids or, or whatever. We had boarders across the street. A few of them liked to imbibe a little bit, and you never knew what was going to happen. <laughs> Some of the entertainment on Portland Avenue would be the fights. And uh, after they fought, they were friends again, you know. <laughs> Pinochle games were big with the old timers. Mrs. McCosey and my mother were partners. Mr. McCosey and my father were partners. And they used to cheat like hell, and my mother and Mrs. McCosey always won. <laughs> Gardens were very serious because you grew all your food that you were going to eat and all you are going to can. It was a competition. Who was going to get the first tomato all the time? They didn't depend on anybody. They knew what they had. They had their own soil, and they knew what they could do. And they were self-sufficient. And if the neighbor needed help, they would get it from the neighbor. Before modern appliances, a simple chore like doing the laundry could wind up being a neighborly visit. People interacted face to face, had conversations all the time, when everybody knew everybody else and everybody respected each other. The American dream happened on Portland Avenue. People came over from different countries and became happy and became successful. That's the American dream for them. They sent their children to school. They, they worked in the factory. They went to church. And everything revolved around uh, those things. On snowy days, Charlie Fall and his brother would wait for Al Keeler to blaze the way through the snow before they left for school. They followed in his footsteps. I think the Gilbert Bennett School was very, very important, very, very important, I think, in everybody's life here. Everyone had a classroom. You had an inside door and an outside door. I don't think there's any schools built like that anymore, you know. After a couple of months in the first grade, they put me in the second grade, and at the end of the school year, I was in the third grade. All the way through, I was a good student. I really was. My mother was very sick, so they put me in school early. And I wasn't going to be five until December. And I struggled for a good many years, but I did pass. I think the teachers liked me if they kind of put me through. <laughs> I loved Ina Driscoll. She was a principal of the Gilbert and Bennett School. She was strict, but she was very, very nice. I loved her. She was a good principal. I mean, she was very kind, but she laid down the law. When Miss Driscoll spoke, you listened. And if there was any noise on the playground, she would just come out and stand there, and kids would just calm down. Ina Driscoll taught at the Gilbert and Bennett School for 31 years. It was not the institution, per se, of the school that brought all of these different ethnicities together. It was the teacher. Ina Driscoll was the linchpin. When I was five years old, I was supposed to start school, and my older sister took me to school. She said, now, you had better behave, because if you don't behave, they're liable to take you up to Miss Driscoll's office and she will give you a strapping. Oh, I heard that, but I, I don't think that was true. I never saw the strap. I've heard stories about uh, someone getting belted. About two and a half inches wide and probably 12 inches long. Probably only one whack, but that's all you needed, you know? Now, he never, they never used it on me or anything. Teacher said, tomorrow we're going to make applesauce, so you bring in apples, and we're going to make some applesauce. After we got the applesauce made, uh, Miss Horty, who was our teacher, said, now this 
seems pretty good. And we're going to bring some up to Miss Driscoll. She said, Bertle, you and Eric take this up to Miss Driscoll. So <laughs> Eric had an older sister as well, so the two of us were scared kids, and we walked up there and got to her office. And of course, the door was closed. So Eric said, what are we going to do? And I said, well, we can't leave it out here. He said, well, you knock on the door. And I said, no, you knock on the door. She took it from us, and she said, thank you so much. And of course, we went running back to the first grade because we not got it strapped. So that was one of the first real experiences of school that I had when I started to go to school. She was head of the Girl Scouts, and I was a Girl Scout. And I can remember one thing impressed me so much with her, that on a starry night, she takes several of us Girl Scouts, and we'd walk, just studying the stars and so forth and so on. And I, I just loved it. You got your groceries downtown. Everyone carried their groceries. The store was the place where you got your news. This is where everybody met. Connery Brothers was probably the first store in Georgetown. It became the biggest store. You could buy furniture, clothes, groceries, coal, oil, lumber, chicken feed, lime, anything. Matter of fact, when my mother and father were married in 1910, they went to Connery's and bought some of their furniture. Conries used to deliver, they take your order, and if you paid the bill or paid something on your bill, you got a little bag of candy for the kids. <laughs> something. Harold Conry was one of the nicest guys you could ever meet. A and P, Gus and Walford Carlson was right there. And we knew Gus because he happened to be the organist in our church. And he had been with the AMP for many, many, many years. It was not a very big store. You told the, the clerk what you wanted. He went and got it and brought it back to the counter. And then he went and got something else. And when he got that, he came and got something else. And when you were done, he would take a big paper bag and he'd pick up each one and see what it was cost. And he'd write and it down the in the paper bag. Six and the six and a four, that's a ten. With the eight, that's a ten. And they'd go down and add it all up. <laughs> Everyone dealt in plain money. My dad? was a hard-working, very honest man. My father, at one time, was selling dry goods suits. Then he had groceries and meat. The store was in the front, and we had kitchen, dining room, living room in the back, and four bedrooms upstairs. The store was open seven days a week. We were five children. We were all involved in the store. The meat market was Mr. Perry's meat market. And, of course, there was Bert Kearns, who sold us about anything and everything, but did not sell food. Bert Kearns would open the store for anywhere from 6 to 6.30 and close anywhere from 9.30 to 10.30. And he stood there at the counter, falling asleep. There was nothing very modernistic about this at all. When you came in the front door, uh, right over there behind that area, there was a desk. It was like they'd move something out of the way and drop the desk down in there. There was so much stuff in front of it, in back of it, behind it, and on the other side as well. I really don't remember how they got into that desk, but could certainly couldn't get to the desk from the front door. And I remember they had this big pot belly stove right in the middle there for heat, and they had seats all around it. And uh, we'd all just go over there. As kids, I used to hang around over there all the time. He had some old pool tables that he used to put clothes on that he was selling, like men's jeans or overalls or something like that. He had lights hanging down with a cord with a pull chain. And as he walked through the area that he was going to, he'd turn it on. When he came back, he would turn it off. If you were going to buy something in the, in the back of the store, he'd light that bulb. And then if you didn't buy it, he'd turn the light off and come back on the front. Bert was what you would call a little thrifty. Kearns' store, as far as I was concerned, was great. It had anything you can imagine. On one side, they had housewares. 
like uh, threads and linens. You had to pay telephone inside. They sold toys. Model airplane kits. Soups. Men's clothing. And tools. He had a lot of hand tools in there. Magazines, the newspapers. Cookies, bread. Ice cream. He current his head up. Ice cream. He sold candy. He sold gasoline, motor oil. And a big candy counter. Notebooks, pencils, pens, candy. kerosene. Magazines, cream, newspapers, candy, stationery, toys, clothes, Housewares, Ice linen. cream. Canned soup. Because he had so much stuff there all over the place. And fireballs. We call them jawbreakers. And Tootsie Rolls, that long, not like today, that long. And for a nickel, you got a Tootsie Roll. Hmm? The peanut lady, as I remember her, was a character that everybody in Georgetown knew. She'd be up four or five o'clock in the morning cooking her peanuts. It looked almost like a, a uh, almost like a barbecue uh, grill with a cover on it. Peanut, peanut, you could hear. She walked to Ridgefield, down to Norwalk, walked all over. And you didn't want to give her a coin that you thought you were going to sneak in. She might not have had good eyesight, but she could feel and knew what, knew what the heck denomination that coin was. The boys would take a penny, and they'd wrap it in aluminum foil, really good and tight. And try to give her that, and she would feel it. Hey, that's an old, that's an old dime, that's a penny. Ooh. She didn't have to depend on anybody. Mama Jo made a living selling peanuts. I had several paper routes. You inherited them from your brothers years ago. See? We delivered in the snow. We're like the mailman. Weather didn't stop us six days a week. And I would go down Ego Stretch and then come back up Old Mill Road, up Highland Avenue around, and down Main Street, and then back home. I delivered the Norwalk Hour and the Bridgeport Post. Norwalk Hour is 24 cents a week. Sometimes the money would be in the milk bottle, or sometimes under it. Or if they had a mat, it would be under the mat. You could leave money any place years ago. Nobody stole anything, you know. You always want to leave the penny change for some of them. Otherwise, you'd hear where it was the penny. But they would take you in, that same person, and feed you with cookies and sweeted buns, but they wanted that penny change. <laughs> Before the war, the workers were the workers. The management was the management. Period. Everyone was afraid because they needed a job. When World War II broke out, 235 men from Georgetown enlisted. When the war caused a shortage of manpower, women stepped up to fill those jobs. Rosie the Riveter was here in Georgetown. In fact, the building right across from the fire department was known as the girls' building. 235 men went to war. Roy Sodergren and Harry Pryor did not return. Every Memorial Day, there was a parade. And we used to start from Gilbert Bennett School, go down around by Lou Miller's house over Church Street, out North Main Street, up Route 7. We'd have a school bus take the younger kids. The rest of us would march or ride our bikes. And then we'd decorate the bikes with red, white, and blue paper. Go up to the Branchville Cemetery. We all brought flowers up to the veterans' graves. It was great, because, you know, the small town, there's nothing going on in, in a, a parade like that. That was the big thing. GIs returned from the war, their wives from wartime employment, and they were looking for more for themselves. Unions grew throughout the nation, and Gilbert and Bennett couldn't command Georgetown workers the way they once had done. You could tell them where the hell to go, and 
working conditions were a lot better after the war. Because I think we all got a little smarter. Halloween, there was a mystery with the church bell ringing. People couldn't understand why it would be ringing that late at night. I can remember hearing it during the night. I'd be in bed. I could hear that bell ringing, and no one could figure out, how in the heck is that bell ringing and there's nobody around? Every Halloween, the bell rang. And I can remember hearing stories about the state police coming down from Ridgefield and uh, checking out the church, and there was nobody there. Can you imagine? Those people would think the ghosts were coming back again. It appears that there were those young guys who worked in the factory. And diagonally across from the Gilbert Memorial Church was the big three-story building of the factory. And they had a, a thin wire going from the factory over to the bell to the church across the street. The wire was attached to the bell. And if you went down there in the middle of the night, there were no street lights. How could you see a thin wire going all the way across? It was pretty difficult to see. They'd be up there pulling the bell. And people would be walking around wondering how the heck that bell is ringing. And they'd be up in the window watching. The factory whistle dominated Georgetown. We lived so close. When the factory whistle went off, it was really loud. And also, when the train had come up from New York, we said, oh, it's, it's 20 minutes to 10. We knew that the train was coming through. Then there'd be another one coming down, going towards New York, 10, 15. Oh, it's 10, 15. There goes the train. When the fire company was organized back in 1928, it was truly a volunteer fire company. And all the young men, they, they all belonged to it. Everybody, gung-ho, belonged to the fire company. In many ways, the firehouse, as even today in a small town, is the center of the town. The day I got married, the firehouse burned down. February 24th, 1946, the shop whistle, we're all up, boop, 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 it kept blowing. And we went down, you knew where it was because you could see the flames. And Dick Mountain was there. My brother Eddie was going to go in and try to get a truck out. Dick says, oh, no, no, no. Let him go. And thank God he did. The next day, the whole town came down to see what was going on there. It was a big loss. That was part of the town, your protection. Other people loaned us vehicles. I believe we even got an army vehicle from the government. And that was probably the best thing that ever happened, that old stable that they were in. And then Burke Kearns donated the land where they are now. Old Lou Miller used to walk around the shop, and he'd say to the guys working there, that's the way, work as hard as you can. You need the money, and we need the wire. I worked at the wire mill from 1947 till 1949. Harry Colley and I were the electricians. Harry was the brains and I was a good worker. The lighting in the twisting room, that's where they made the chicken wire with the big two inch holes in it. And, and there would be a light on each end of the machine. And the machine was quite long. A guy sat in the middle and he watched these rods that had the wire in that you stick them off and spin. And there was a little hole in the rod that he knew when it got down there, he had to change it and put another one in. And they would do it fast so they wouldn't lose any money, you know. And uh, when Lou Miller came by, if he saw a bright light in there, he would take the 60 watt bulb and put a 40. That's the type of man he was, miserable old man. It was a very noisy place. In the twister room, it was so noisy that you couldn't hear yourself think. Governor Bennett had a bunch of accidents, all related to unsafe working practices. 
And if there was a safety feature in there, workers would bypass it because they all needed the money. They were on piecework. All they wanted to do was make money. They didn't care about safety. Tell them we're going to shut down the machine. What do you mean? I tell you, piecework here. What are I going to do? No matter what you did, they try to bypass all your safety features. And another one we had with a foot switch where they had to keep their foot on it far enough away and they would put a brick on that one. And one day a guy got his arm as he was inspecting his wire coming into the machine, which he wasn't supposed to have his hands on, got his arm caught, rolled him right up. And we shut the machine down right away, Harry Collie and I, and backed it off and had broken his arm. I admit it. It was like a piece of spaghetti. Well, I don't think it was any more dangerous than any other kind of a manufacturing facility of that caliber. 107 ripped the heart out of Georgetown. It cut Main Street in half. It hurt us very much. 107 was our backyard. Just ruined the little town the way it came through. Tore it up, tore it to bits. They decided that that was the best route to put the new road in, and they just did it. My father's and mother's house was taken by, what do you call it, Emmon Domain, mm -hmm. and another one on Smith Street. They carried away Georgetown one truckload at a time. They blasted it and hauled it away to Norwalk. They filled in Pete Swamp. You grow up in a house, and, and all of a sudden, somebody comes and knocks it down. I think that. The thing that really bothered me the most was the age of my parents. And I thought to myself so often, here he comes to the town of the American dream, and now his house has been taken away from him. Sure, he was paid, but that doesn't, all the money in the world doesn't replace the home you have. They didn't rant and rave and carry on any. They were, they were good Christian people who could accept lots of things that some of us can't. In October of 1955, there was a great flood. Two previous tropical storms had saturated the ground. And then, 12 inches of rain fell in four days. It rained for three or four days in a row, and pretty steady rain. And my brother Johnny and I took his Jeep, and we couldn't get out of Ono Heights because the little brook down there was a river. Louie kept coming back. He said, something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. He kept saying, it's going to be bad tonight. I said, how could it be bad? Louie had done a job down in Georgetown. He had a bulldozer or something, one of the big machines, and that was underwater. He stayed down there all, all night long and kept going back and forth. People of Georgetown had no idea how saturated the ground was upstream. They'd had no idea that the dam at Great Pond had been weakened. The whole area was ripe for disaster. The dam at Great Pond broke. The water came down, broke the dam at the uh, wire mill. The pressure just kept breaking the dams down. It was awful. Terrible, terrible, terrible. The state highway did such a job with that 107, they put a culvert in, it was too small to take care of the water. That's why Georgetown got flooded out. By morning, it stopped raining. We went down, and I couldn't believe it. Perry's Meat Market, you know how big some of these meat cases are? Standing on end. Huge freezers, they're upright. The water, the force of the water stood them up. Everybody was upset, we couldn't believe what we were seeing. The Norwalk River ran right through the, the mill. There was a bridge right over the, the river there, just out behind the office, that had been washed out. Then there was another one where the railroad track 
came in. That had been washed out. 50 gallon drums had been washed out of the factory proper somewhere going down the river. People try to get through areas that were impossible. Most of the roads were closed because of the bridge washouts. Along with other firemen, we were trying to help people get stuff out of the road. And there was a lot of muck and stuff in the road. We hosed it all down as best we could. And then we had to sanitize everything and paint. You know, everything had to be scrubbed down because of contamination. A lot of work. And the wire mill, I mean, the wire mill after that flood, they didn't have to worry about any more pollution because it was all down in Long Island Sound about that time. After the flood, old Bert, he was really devastated from what, what had happened. The, the water down through his store it had to be about four or five feet deep around where he was. And uh, he was in there cleaning up probably 20 hours a day. And it really took a toll on him. He ended up with pneumonia, and he died not too long after. Lou Miller was the kind of a person who stood out anywhere. He was always dressed with a suit and had a vest, and it had the old-fashioned pocket watch in the vest, you know, with the chain and the whole bit. I think he only had one eye. If he asked a question, he expected an answer, and it had better be the right answer. I can remember my father telling me one time, he came back about 12.31 from lunch, and Lou Miller says, you're late, go home. You didn't argue, because if you argued, then he'd tell you not to come back tomorrow either. He was just an old grouch. All he wanted was money. He could tell you how much he was earning on his stocks when the light went on. Old Lou, get his mail, he said, well, I see how much money I made in stocks today. I do remember him coming down to the post office every morning, and they used to tease him down there, some of, uh, the other old guys that came down about, did you get any stock money today? He'd be sitting there with Don in the waste paper basket. And if there were envelopes, the, the envelope wasn't, the stamp wasn't stamped, he'd take the stamp home. <laughs> Those kids each had a bicycle, and I didn't have a bicycle. It seemed that I could ride the bicycle uphill if I could, otherwise I'd just push it up for them and they rode the bike down on the hill, right, going in front of Lou Miller's house. One day, a Sears Roebuck truck pulled up in front of my house. And my mother went to the door, and he asked her if this was the Rosendahl house. I have a bicycle to be delivered here. She said, we didn't order a bicycle. And needless to say, I was one happy kid, and jumped on that bicycle, and was riding it up and down and all over the place. And every time I saw Lou Miller, he'd say, where'd you find that thing down at the EMP? And I'd say, no, somebody brought it to my house. I, nobody would bring things like that to your house. Teased me every time he saw me about that bike. I'm almost sure that Lou Miller bought that bicycle for me. I don't know who else could have bought it. Although he was considered a rogue and a BS artist and everything else, he was a hero in my book. When Lou Miller died in 1949, his wife, Olive, changed her name to Carrie, had a rebirth, and went out and bought herself a Cadillac. After Lou died, Olive had a chance to live. When Roland Matson came back from the war, he renewed his friendship with Mrs. Miller. And Roland Matson rented her little barn in the back Fixed the barn up, a nice little studio. He was different. He was a very, very talented person. He could play a piano. He could paint a picture. He could draw anything, decorate anything. He was also a um, hat designer for ladies. Carrie really enjoyed having somebody in the back that was so talented, and she kind of took Roland under her wing. And he was fantastic to her, and so was she to him. He was getting involved in music. 
You began to meet a lot of fashionable people. All of a sudden, we had people in Georgetown that were really artists, the kind that you only read about in the newspaper. It was different than anything had ever been seen in Georgetown like it. There'd never been anything like it. We're on our way to Connecticut to a little town called George. He had written a story of Georgetown about his parents coming over from Finland. Great show. It was very successful. It was a good, good, clean show. Roland was so proud of Georgetown, it wasn't funny. Two or three years in a row, he arranged for band concerts in the summertime over behind his house. And uh, he had a whole big stage built and everything else. And everyone in the community was invited, no charge. And there were a lot of people. In its 171 years of operation, Gilbert and Bennett manufactured over 400 million miles of wire. It's beyond my, my imagination, it's so much. It's beyond the scope of my thinking about <laughs> That's a heck of a lot of wire, exactly. <laughs> By the mid-1980s, the mill was worn out, there were new environmental standards, there was labor unrest, and a lot of competition. In 1989, the factory was closed forever. Workers were faced with difficult choices. Many chose to stay in Georgetown rather than go to areas with better employment and higher wages. They chose a church they were familiar with, an ethnic organization, a volunteer fire company. They chose family and friends and decades of memories. I was drafted and served in World War II. And I found myself in places I'd never even heard of before. I've been an aircrew member on a B-24 bomber, and some of those trips were not pleasant. One time in particular came back to the barracks and said to myself, God, if I ever, if I ever get home to Georgetown again, I'll never, ever leave. When the plant shut down, there was a void in Georgetown. When I walked through, I could see all of the old timers that worked around the machines in there. It was just such an, a funny feeling. You could see Jimmy Barrett looking out the window, and Ray Ellis delivering scrap wire to somebody. And as I walked out, thinking, this will never be again. I used to go down to the river with my friend. Her name was Mary Loprest. And we would sit there and just talk and just keep throwing stones into the water. We always thought that was so wonderful just to do something like that. I thought this spot was so big. But as I got older, I realized it was just a small spot, but it was very special to me. A small thing can be important to you.
working, busy working, busy working, working at the mill, weaving wire. Busy, 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 screening for mosquitoes so you won't get marred. Fitting for the livestock to keep them in the yard. Working at the mill, working at the mill, working at the mill, weaving wire. Working at the mill, weaving wire. This is screening for the strainers to sift and refine. Fencing for the chickens to keep them off the line. Working at the mill, working at the mill, working at the mill, weaving wire. Feeling kind of dizzy, working at the loom. And you find a loony when you walk in the room. Working at the mill, weaving wire. Busy, busy, busy. Turning off the copper as gold as your hair. Working for a love nest to let my lady fair. Working at the mill, working at the mill, working at the mill, weaving wire. Working at the mill, working at the mill, working at the mill, weaving wire. Please don't frown. We'll all be together like birds of a feather in that wonderful place. Just down. Thank <laughs> you.